was shipping conventional milk. It was $10 for 100 pounds of milk. And I was ready to quit because it wasn't paying the bills. And I prayed about it and God said milk cows. In about 2000, there was a market developed for organic milk. And it was a pushback against the hormones that were being shot into the cows because the moms feeding their children did not appreciate that type of practice. Okay. Our food system is failing. It's failing the farmers, the animals, the soil, the consumer, and we have too few companies to bring about change. They lost 18,000 cows one day. 3% that makes me sick. of the Texas milk production was gone. If your focus in the food system is on efficiency mm -hmm. and low cost, you're gonna cut corners. So if you don't like what's being produced, mm -hmm. you shop somewhere else. Yeah, you're certified organic. Can you use pesticides? No, here's what you can do. Welcome back to the Sustainable Farm Podcast. My name is Jaylee and I am here with Jerry and today we are going to be talking about organic food. So is organic food, uh, particularly meat and dairy, actually better for you? On average, organic food costs 47% more than conventional food, so is it worth the price? What does it even mean to be certified organic? Um, and in this episode, we'll cover all that and more from both the farmer's perspective and the consumer's perspective to help you make the best choices when it comes to your food. So Jerry, what does USDA certified organic even mean? Well, the fact that it's USDA means that it is government stamped and approved. <laughs> yep. And this began with the National Organic Food Production Act in 1990. Wow. Uh, it's, it's not that long ago. It actually started, if, if you think of the term organic, mm. it's a different approach. Let's, let's just be honest and let's, let's get it out on the table. Let's do it. Okay, the industrial model mm -hmm. is what we have in our food system today. Yeah. And the industrial model, uh, when I went to college for agriculture, they taught you to specialize so you become a dairy farmer. Okay, so you only have dairy cows. Okay. Okay, we've gotten off that train and we're very different today, but that's where we lived for a long time. Okay. We were in conventional commodity milk production. Yeah. Okay. okay. So then a thing called BST came along. Do you know what? I don't. Okay. Bovine recumbent somatotrophin. It was a hormone that they shot the cows with. Monsanto created it. I hate okay. it already. <laughs> okay. And it increased milk production about 15%. Okay. So I'm F sitting... 15, 1, 5, 15%? 15%. Okay. So if you're if you're understanding industrial agriculture, mm. the bigger the farm, the more hundred weights of milk, mm -hmm. the lower your cost it is to produce per hundred weight. Okay. Because you have the economy of scale. Sure. Now most of our farms are not big farms. Yeah. As a matter of fact, until I don't have a specific year, but in the last twenty years. We've seen 10,000 cow farms. Let's, let's go back when I started. 1978, mm -hmm. we had 55 cows. Okay. It was in a stanchion barn. Wow. We had to milk with two bucket milkers and a carry pail. My gosh. See, that's, that's what I said in the last episode, that pe that's what people think <laughs> when okay. they think of So we're, we're talking, my dad and myself, yeah. full time, uh -huh. carry, all day, yeah. carrying milk, yeah. feeding the cows, we had our hands full. We're a far cry from that now. Okay. So uh, in the 70s, that was 1978, in the late 70s, the first freestall barn. Mm -hmm. What's a freestall barn? I'm not sure. Explain it. Okay. We had a stanchion barn. Yeah. So that would be like if you went to a... Yeah, I know what a stanchion is. You walk them, it's like a, 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 like a little stage. That like you a step parking on. lot. Yeah. And they're held in there. Okay. Yep. Okay. So you have a location and that cow is... In her spot. Yep. Yep. Okay. One at a time. One at a time. And they vary in size mm -hmm. and the cows vary in size. So you fit the cow according to the size. Yeah. 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 So that's when they go to the bathroom, it goes in the gutter, they mm -hmm. stay clean and everything works. So it's very systematic. It's very cut and dried. And other than a pipeline milking system, mm -hmm. it limits how many cows you can milk. Yeah. Now, this is something 
nobody has ever thought of. Maybe, maybe they have. But I, I said, if they had passed a law in those years, in the 1970s, yeah. that every dairy farmer had to milk his own cows <laughs> night and morning. Uh -huh. How many 40,000 cow farms do you think we would have? A lot less. <laughs> okay. None, really. None. Because you can't do it. No. But they didn't think of that. Right. Because they didn't see the technology coming. Mm -hmm. Today we have robotics. Yeah. So we have machines that milk cows. Yeah. And some of the old farmers would say, that's impossible. You can't do that. And my dad was in his 90s, and his favorite thing to do was to take those old guys that were like him who said, you can't do it, and he would give them a tour of the farm that he helped at that had robotic milkers. I mean, he loved doing that, proving them that a machine could do that. Yeah. Because any farmer knows it's a challenge to milk a cow. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a relationship. I still haven't had a chance. Sometime when I come up here, I want to milk a cow. I need you to like teach me how to do it. Okay. So we're why why are we talking about the industrial model when we're talking about organic farming? Because the industrial model enabled the farms to grow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The freestall barn. You could build a barn. The first one I saw held seventy two cows. Wow. And they could walk to the feed manger mm -hmm. and then go lay down over here and they were not tied up chained up in they the stanchion in stalls or anything they it was, it was free open free stalls okay that's what that means yeah makes sense and so you can you can make a longer barn you can make a wider barn mm -hmm. and there was one in Demet, texas last april that had eighteen thousand cows under a roof not eighteen hundred eighteen thousand <laughs> That's insane. And this was a dairy farm? It was a dairy farm. Oh, my gosh. And they had a catastrophe. Oh, no. Now, we're in Texas. Have you ever been to Texas? I have, actually. Okay. It's a big state. Yeah. They do things in a big way. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. It had a roof over it. Mm -hmm. And because it's Texas, it gets hot. Don't tell me all these cows cooked. They had insulation, spray foam insulation yeah. on the ceiling. And they had fans all along one wall. Okay. So you have a six mile an hour breeze coming mm -hmm. through to keep the cows cool in yeah. Texas. And they drove in there with a manure truck to suck the manure out of the okay. pit. And it caught fire. Oh my gosh. And they lost 18,000 cows one day. That's awful. It is. Oh my gosh. 3% that makes me sick. of the Texas milk production was gone. Wow. That's, that's really 3% okay. within one farm. One farm. Now, the industrial model has enabled and actually encouraged an increase in size. Mm -hmm. We have the technology. We have rotary parlors. It's just like a, a merry-go-round. Yeah. The cow walks on. The milking machine goes on. And then they get off. And one person can stand still and, and do that. Wow. So we have the technology. We have the machinery to have huge... You know, 40,000 40, cow dairies. Yeah. This keeps the cost low. Mm -hmm. You said it was more expensive, 47% more than conventional food. Yeah. So where did this organic market come from? Right. Because I was shipping conventional milk. It was $10 for 100 pounds of milk, mm -hmm. 10 to $12 for many years. Yeah. And I was ready to quit because it wasn't paying the bills. Mm -hmm. And I prayed about it, and God said, milk cows. Yeah. So I kept milking. I wasn't real happy. Not real happy. I complained a lot. Yeah. But I kept milking cows. In about 2000, there was a market developed for organic milk. And it was a pushback against the hormones that were being shot oh. into the cows because the moms feeding their children did not appreciate that type of practice. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because I was wondering that myself. And when you said that the um, the OFDA, or no, OFPA, the Organic Food Production, Production Act, Act, that was um, in 1990, I was really surprised by that because obviously there was a time in this world where everything was organic. It started out that way. So I was curious okay. myself when this... This This is a... Where this came to be. This is a definition by a government agency, mm -hmm. the USDA... A bill was passed, and within it, they established 
what was acceptable mm-hmm. and what was not. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So when, when you have a, a food system developing in a country and it gets to the point where the consumers are not happy with it, yeah, you have what you call an alternative develop. Hmm. Okay. Well, in the organic food system and the raw milk movement mm-hmm. are both parallel on the same path. They are a reaction by the consumer to what's happening in our food system. And I, I think they both are somewhat founded in safety, right? Because the, um, the, the reason that milk started becoming pasteurized was a, a safety aspect. And now the organic has come along because you said that there were mothers who were unhappy with the, with the hormones that were being. Yep. Yep. And people didn't like all those cows. Yeah. Under one roof. Yeah. Not going out and eating grass. No. So it's a moral thing as well as a safety thing. Well, if your focus in the food system is on efficiency Mm -hmm. and low cost. Yeah. You're going to cut corners. Yeah. Yeah. Now it costs the animals Mm. in their lifestyle because they're not free to go out and be a cow and feed themselves in the grass. Okay? Yeah. You're looking sad. I need to I'm move sad. on. This. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I always, I, I, I'm not a big fan of um, veganism because I think that we, a lot of the stuff that we find in meat, we, we really need. Um, and there's a whole bunch of research and that's a whole separate thing. But the people who are vegan because they don't like the treatment of animals and they don't see an alternative to that, I totally understand that because that is a whole moral and ethical dilemma that I think a lot of people face. So yes, it makes, okay. me, it makes me sad when you talk about the, the poor treatment of animals. So when, when a pendulum swings on a clock, mm-hmm. it goes so far. Yeah. And then it comes back. Yeah. And we're seeing a change in our food system. Yeah, definitely. And there, uh, there are some big players in our food system. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you brought up, uh, how do you say it, Mon- Monsanto? Mon- Monsanto. Yeah. Okay, they've, they've been sold to Bayer. But this goes back to World War II and I.B. Farber. I mean, there were these yeah. companies have been in this business, the chemical business and the war business, mm. and they just converted it over to fertilizer yeah. and drugs. So anyway, the, the natural systems that my grandfather grew up with, yeah. because we were isolated, we didn't have... The transportation system, we didn't have the technology. Right. We didn't have electricity. Mm-hmm. It limited us to physical labor. Yeah. Sure. We used horses, then we got tractors. So things are changing, but the public, the consumer is always right. Well, they're the ones purchasing the products. Right. They're a necessary <laughs> entity here. So if you don't like what's being produced, mm. You shop somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. So the consumer is always right. And so, and we have freedom in America Mm. to choose what we want to eat. Yeah. So the organic market, there were people that were farming organically, but they weren't getting paid uh, a higher pay price. You. Right. Yeah. So let's take my farm. We have, we have the same acres. Uh, We weren't using any sprays. Okay. We, we were feeding conventional feed, mm-hmm. which had to change when we went when organic, organic yep. which was 2002. And we had to find an organic grain supplier. The company that we were buying feed from was HK Webster. Okay. They were in New Hampshire, Blue Seal Feeds. I did business with them for 25 years. Wow. They were a Christian company. They were a wonderful company. They had good quality products, and I was changing from a conventional milk production to organic. Yeah. And I needed to buy organic grain. Mm-hmm. So I called the vice president in Londonderry, New Hampshire, and I said, this is what's going to happen. All of these small family farms that are grazing their cows are going to leave the conventional market because it had huge farms in a low pay scale. Yeah. And they can't compete. No. So they're going to switch to the organic market. 
-hmm. and they were paying twenty dollars for a hundred pounds of milk. Wow! I was used to getting ten yeah. or twelve, and now I was getting paid twenty. The same cows, the same grass, yeah, the same farm, different grain. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, "Would you be my supplier?" And they said, "What's organic?" <laughs> Because it was brand new. And this was in 2002. This was in 2002. Was not that long ago. Yeah. It's it's blowing my mind. <laughs> I wanted them to dedicate one of their facilities yeah. to organic. Yeah. And I was trying to help them follow the path yeah. that the farmers were yeah. going to follow. Did they? Uh, they did not. Oh. Are they still in business? Uh, I don't know. Huh. I don't know. I have to call and see. Interesting. So we found a, a grain supplier mm -hmm. uh, in Penyan. We produced organic milk. And I felt like, now, what does it mean to be organic? One of the requirements is 30% of the dry matter has come from pasture during the grazing season. So okay. your cows have to go out and feed themselves on the pasture. Okay, 30%. 30%. All right. Very easy. You could still feed other feeds in the barn. Yeah. Uh, you could feed grain. Mm-hmm. Uh, it had to be organic grain. Now, just so I'm clear, because we're talking about cows, is that the same thing as being grass-fed? Because you, you, you just painted a picture of them going out and eating it off the pasture. Can it can it also be said that that can be brought into them at, at the rate of 30%, or do they have to go out and get it themselves? They have to go out on pasture. Okay. Okay. So if, if, if something is organic, then there's it's at least a little bit grass-fed. Yep. Okay. That, that's interesting. I did not know that. Okay. Okay. Um, so there were a lot of legalities written up in this. I'm app. sure. I'm sure. You couldn't use herbicides. Okay. You couldn't use pesticides. Yeah. So what we're seeing is a pushback to the chemistry in agriculture. Yeah. And a movement towards more natural processes. Mm. Letting the cows go out and behave in the pasture mm. and feed themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um if you had a cow that got sick, now you know what I did at this time? I went and bought, I had Holstein cows, black and white cows. I bought a Jersey bull. I bought a Jersey bull because when we got married, we were given a golden retriever, a registered golden retriever. His name was Biscuits, beautiful dog. Oh, I love that. Biscuits. But purebreds have, golden retrievers have hip dysplasia. Okay. So they have a weakness. Yeah. Because of their purebred breeding. What's the Holstein's weakness? Um, that you that you felt you needed to cross well, it? The, the reason we had Holstein is because they make the most value. Yeah, they're high the producers. Okay. Yes. I was shifting my mindset from quantity. To quality. To quality. Yeah. And what I wanted was a mutt. I wanted hybrid vigor. Yeah. Yeah. And jerseys have the high butterfat content. They have the high butterfat. And when I crossed the Holstein with the Jersey, mm -hmm. that first cross was a phenomenal animal. Mm. High butter fat, high milk production. Uh, it was amazing. Yeah. But then after that, we had to continue to choose what we were going to breed them to. Yeah. So Kelby's using milking shorthorn. He's using Angus. Uh, he's using some limousine. He's bringing in other breeds. But what we're getting is, what is hybrid vigor? Do you know what that is? Hybrid vigor. I, well, uh, explain it. You'll be able to. Let's, let's just take a plant. If you have plants, and this one has a weakness, mm -hmm. and this one has a strength, mm -hmm. you cross them, Yep. and you gain some of that strength to overcome this weakness. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. So it evens out the playing field. Yeah. So they're less susceptible to problems. Yes. So in the organic uh, protocols, you can't use antibiotics if you have an animal that's sick. Right. You have to take that. I, I've heard, because I wondered about this, because for, uh, for a little bit there, I was like, well, I don't want to support um, a place that isn't going to take care of their sick animals. But then I, I heard that um, usually the sick animals just get pulled from production and they just don't, they, they treat them, but they pull them out of production. So we're required under the organic law to treat that animal. Yeah. But you can try... Uh, Herbal treatments. Okay. Holistic okay. treatments. You can try other things first before yep. you get to like vaccines. And stuff. You have to preserve the health of that animal. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. But the, the 
best way to be healthy is to prevent sickness, right? Sure. So if you're not forcing a lot of high energy feeds and forcing production, Mm. And they're in a more natural. There's not eighteen thousand of them on one roof, right? They're going to be healthy. Yeah. So my whole mindset had to change. Hmm. My approach to life had to change. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. It wasn't about quantity and volume and yeah. push, push, push. Mm-hmm. It was about letting nature keep them healthy and avoiding illness. For example, a closed herd. Do you know what a closed herd is? I think I think it has something to do with not bringing, like you're only keeping like what's being reproduced okay. in the herd. You're not bringing outside. In. So you're not buying in animals yeah. from another farm. Yeah. So a cow will have a calf. Yeah. Every year. Mm-hmm. And we you've have... got you've got enough bulls that you can breed that and it not be related to it. And right. Like, yeah, well, yeah, we yeah. use artificial insemination. Oh, perfect. So we have more animals than we need. And actually, our farm sold cows every October. I heard. I was just talking to Megan about this because I asked. I was like, if I if I want a dairy cow, can I buy one okay. from you guys? <laughs> so let's just do some math. Let's say we've got 45 cows. Yeah. So those cows are going to have 45 calves. Mm-hmm. If half of them are females, how many heifer calves will I have? Like 22, mm-hmm. 23. Somewhere in there, yeah. Now... You raise those heifer calves. We raise all of them. Mm -hmm. And they're a year old. And then you can breed them shortly after that. Mm -hmm. And when they're two years old, they will have calves. Mm -hmm. So you have 45 cows. Mm -hmm. We're talking a lot of animals. Okay. So you have 25, 23 heifers. Yep. And then 23 Mm two-year-olds that are having. So you have 45 plus the 23. You have 60 Eight calves. And this just keeps growing. And I only have 45 stanchions. Yeah. So every fall before this, it's snowing outside right now. I know, it's like a whiteout. Yeah. I keep looking out the window because it's so beautiful. Every fall when the snow was getting ready to come, I would have to bring the cows in the barn. Mm-hmm. So I would go to the organic milk beatings and advertise cows for sale. Because you needed to keep your numbers. I only could fit so many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't keep. Now, are, now is that. Is that because you would be in violation of the certified organic or is that just an ethical, like you just don't want to squeeze that many into one area? I only have so much feed. I only have so much room. Okay. I only have so much time in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have to keep it a workable size. Sure. And the organic market was expanding. Yeah. Because people were getting paid for it. Yeah. And I had good organic cows. Mm. And so every fall- I would sell 10 cows. Were you able to sell those cows for more now that they were organic versus, because I'm sure you were doing that before you went organic for the same reasons. Before I was culling them only when they didn't breed back Mm. or they were too old to milk any longer. Yeah. And I got ground beef price for it. Sure. So now I had a viable market to sell animals for other farms. Wow, that's really interesting. Yes. (laughs) This, This was a game changer. I'm sure. Yeah. So we have more than one income stream now. Love that. Then, so we're talking about organic. Yeah. So we have do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. The actual requirement that you graze the cows is like a regulator to how big you can get. Because you you can only have so many cows on so many. Like there's a, a, a cow to pasture ratio. Okay. So the cows have to walk out and eat, yeah, and they have to walk back and get milked twice a day. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's interesting. So when you get to 200 cows, you got a handful. Taking 200 cows out, bringing them back twice a day. Yeah, if you're keeping them in them. walking distance of the barn, yeah. I mean, there's only so far out they can go. It takes really time to walk that far. Wow. Okay. So this was a self-limiting, which kind of Structure. protected, it protected that special market yeah wow that's really interesting yep and so this to me was the answer to the small family farm because they could graze the cows they didn't have to compete with the big farms Mm -hmm. and it was self-limiting because they could only graze so many cows so you're guaranteed to keep it like uh... well the 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 production is not going to expand right like it did with conventional explosively yeah yeah, to, when to you, where you can't keep up. When you plant a 40,000 cow dairy 
mm-hmm. in a new state, that that puts a lot of farms out of business. Wow. Yeah. All right. Now, so if you're certified organic, you're a sort of certified organic farm, can you use pesticides? No. None at all? Here's what you can do. Anything that's in the, there's a list of substances and part of the, when you're certified, that is by a third party. NOFA New York was our certifier. So they have their own inspectors. They have their own paperwork. Mm-hmm. And so you fill out all the harvests from all your fields, all the products that you use on your farm, all the feeds that you buy. Mm-hmm. So they can come in, an inspector can come yep. in, look at all of your paperwork. And I used to do file reviews for NOFA when I first oh. I was hired by them. That's cool. So I would take a farm from the other state mm-hmm. and look at all of their production and all their numbers, and you could tell what they were doing. And I was going to ask, do they? Do they actually do that? They can, but do they? It's required by the law, and the National Organic Program uh, monitors the certifiers. Okay. All right. And everything was hunky-dory except... What was the hang-up? They're getting paid more money than the conventional producers. The organic farmers. The organic farmers. Yeah. And if you're a producer that's getting $10 and you could be getting $20, the temptation is to try to get into that market. Yeah. And some new players came into the game and they had 5,000 and 8,000 cow dairies Mm -hmm. in Idaho, in California, uh, in other states. Yep. And I don't know how they did it, but they got the paperwork and they flooded the market. Of course they did. Now you can't graze. Uh, These cows are in a confinement in a barn. And they're buying a lot of organic feed. Now the good news is the fields are being farmed organically. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of pesticides and herbicides being used. That's really good, yeah. Okay. But they're, they're destroying the market for these little family farms. Yeah. And this is a corruption of the organic model. And I just participated in the Real Organic Project. Yeah. This is a free certification on top of people that are already certified Mm -hmm. to try to overcome that. Okay. So if you have an 8,000 cow dairy and you're certified organic and your certifier is allowing you to do that, the Real Organic Project will not certify you. Wow. So it just gives the consumer, because it sounds like all of these things start as a way to protect the consumer. And then over time, it gets corrupted and allowances are made and, you know, what have you. And so this is just one more step to try and give the consumer as much information as possible so that they can make their choices. Unfortunately, over this period of time, we see consolidation. What is consolidation? Coming together. Okay. So what... In our first podcast, we talked about the local processors. Yeah. You had a local market. Yeah. Well, there are no local processors and local markets now. Can you can you explain to me what 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 is what do you mean when you say local processor? So we used to have a small local dairy. Weldonian Dairy was in Wellsville. Elmhurst Dairy was in Hornell, and they had a plant. And the the farmers that were in that area sold their milk to them, and they would make ice cream they would make bottled fluid milk they would make cottage cheese would they do were they pasteurizing this milk they were pasteurizing it. okay yep but it was a uh small independent business Mm -hmm. if you go back to the days when we didn't have pay less shoes Mm -hmm. yeah we had degatano shoes okay we had real italians wow that repaired shoes yeah that owned the store that knew how to fix shoes yeah the real deal. The real deal. Leather shoes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want a pair. <laughs> and you talked with the family. Yeah. And it, it went on for generations mm-hmm. until they couldn't compete anymore. Yeah, that's a good okay. uh, example. Interesting. Now, can if you are certified organic, can is there any chance that any certified organic product would be GMO? It will not. It's not approved in the National Organic Program. Okay. Okay. So it, it like it's it that's in the restrictions. The now here's what happens. Okay. What is GMO? G- uh, genetically modified organisms, I think. Okay. So let's say you're you're growing GMO 
canola yeah, in, on, in Ontario. <laughs> yeah. And you have a person that has his own canola that's not GMO mm -hmm. growing down the road. Mm -hmm. And this truck goes by his field and some of his seed gets contaminated. Oh, no. Okay, we have drift. You know what drift yeah. is? Yeah, the wind carries okay. things. Yep. Okay, they cross-pollinates his crop. Mm -hmm. And those are patented seeds. Mm -hmm. And so now the company will sue the farmer because he has GMO seed on his land and he didn't buy the seed from them. My gosh. This has happened. Percy Schmidt. Oh. Okay. So gen genetically modified doesn't behave itself well mm -hmm. because we have a thing called wind. Yeah. So if you have a, an organic farm, now fortunately for Sunny Cove Farm, there's no... Nothing around you. Nothing that GMO. Would, yeah. There's nothing contaminated around us yeah. where we have to prevent that. Good. Okay? And everything we have is in grass. Mm -hmm. And we're not buying any seeds. These these are benefits mm -hmm. in your health, in your food system. Yeah. If you're staying away from this stuff. So, so if it's organic, it, it can't be GMO. No. But... Someone growing GMO next to an organic farm, the drift, the wind can cross pollinate and contaminate his crops. And it's not the organic farmer's fault. Right. But he's the one that has to suffer. Can he, so if that happens, the, the organic certifier would have issue with that. They'd, would they lose their certification or? Well, the organic farm would be the one that was in trouble. Yeah. But they didn't cause the problem. Right, right. They just were yeah, within wind drift of that. So it doesn't work mm. is my point. Okay, I see. This should be the problem of the GMO yeah. supplier. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Doesn't seem fair. But this is where we're living. And so as, as years went on and we had... We had a system that I thought was going to help the small family farm. Mm -hmm. It be began, seemed like it was. It was corrupted. Okay. Okay. And now we have huge farms. Well, what happened in New England just a year or so ago was there was no market for organic milk because it costs a lot of money to run around to these little farms and pick up little amounts of milk. Yeah. And they could source it from one that was corrupted, mm -hmm. a huge supplier. Mm -hmm much more economically. Yeah, cheaper. At this point, Sunny Cove Farm transitioned to grass milk. Okay? Yeah. This was a brand new thing. This is its own little market. Uh, uh, their own private market, a higher pay price, and you could not feed grain to the cows. Mm -hmm. The milk production went down. Because the grain helps them produce. Right. Now... We were talking at an earlier one about the cream line. Yeah. A cow will make so much butter fat each day. Okay. According to how she is fed, mm -hmm. that can be diluted in a larger volume of milk or a smaller okay, volume of milk. Okay, I see. So they were producing less because they got taken off grain, but the butter content stayed the same. Butter the fat butter fat was still there. Interesting. But it was in less liquid. Hmm. Sounds like a really rich milk. <laughs> So we're talking dense nutrition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Okay. So it's a superior product. Far superior. Were you able to charge more? Well, we got paid more mm -hmm. because it was a startup. Mm -hmm. And so they, in order to get people to jump ship from where they're supplying now, yeah. they they put out a very high price. Mm -hmm. And and the um, big operations that were corrupted couldn't compete with this right because they, there's there's no way that you can grass feed 40,000 cows well they were in a in a barn right exactly so they it's untouchable and it goes back to what you were talking about before they've got to go out and then come back to be milked there's yeah. there's no yeah. way so so this was a I thought well this is this is heaven yeah great <laughs> this is the best thing that could be until I was, I was hoping there wasn't going to be it until <laughs> the market they developed was actually using yogurt, but they wanted to get access to all the stores, mm -hmm. 
and you have to have a brand, which means you have to have fluid milk, yogurt, all these all products, products to get shelf space. Because we talked about consolidation. I see. Consolidation happened in the retail realm now as well. Now I see well. where you were going with that. Okay. okay. So, so not, that, that did not help the little guy because the little guy can't necessarily produce all the products. Well, when they tried to to get the brand, they tried to increase the volume, the size of the business. So they started putting requirements on the farmer mm -hmm. to supply more. Okay. So if you only had eight cows, they wouldn't stop and pick you up because no, it wasn't yeah. worth it. Right. Interesting. So it was a poor business model. Mind you, is all of this still being pasteurized? It's Through everything we've talked about, it's, it's still being pasteurized. Okay, the organic milk was being ultra-pasteurized. What's that mean? A higher temperature. It's heated to a higher temperature. It's 283 degrees. So it's overboiling. It's so hot. And it kills everything. Why? But it increases the shelf life because this company was selling the product produced in New York to California customers. Okay. Okay. Yikes. So they have to have a long shelf life to get it shipped all the way to California. So what do you learn from this? Our food system is failing. Oh, yeah. It's failing the farmers, the animals, the soil, the consumer. And we have too few companies mm -hmm. to bring about change. And a whole lot of corruption in the meantime. And a lot of corruption. And a thing called corporate capture. Tell me more about that. Okay. When you when you are one of three or four companies in a nation yeah. that controls a market. Like in all of America. All of America. You infiltrate government agencies. Here's what happened with the organic realm. Okay. They they created the National Organic Standards Board made up of farmers to review materials like preservatives, things that could be used as additives mm -hmm. in the in the milk and the foods yeah. to either approve or disapprove them. Okay. So this is the way that the farmers would have a voice. Mm -hmm. But year after year, they got more big business people in there. Mm -hmm. hmm. They infiltrate the decision making and the law writing. And now products are being used. Carrageenan is one of them. These products that are put into uh, the processed milks, uh, yogurts and so mm -hmm. forth, ice creams, they're preservatives, they are enhancers, emulsifiers. They're getting put in organic products. Yeah. So they're actually eroding the purity of these products. Now, the ultra-pasteurization was an issue because when you're sourcing milk nationwide and commingling it and then processing it, yeah. you have to treat it so that it'll have a long shelf life mm -hmm. in order to get it to where the consumer is going to buy it. Yeah. So UHT, ultra-high temperature, was what they did to fix it. Well, this kills the milk. So why would you spend more for a grass-fed uh, organic cow to produce this milk and then have it killed, have the, the milk killed. Well, I don't know heat. exactly the answer to that question, but I will say that it, to me as the consumer, it doesn't matter because I'm not getting any of this information. As the consumer, I don't know anything about any of this. Okay. If, you know, outside of me right now, but like if I'm just the, the general consumer and I'm at the store and I see a carton of organic grass-fed milk, I'm like, I got babies at home. This is the best thing on the shelf for me to purchase. I have no idea any of this. And and they will not give you that information right. because it will undermine their marketing. Yeah. So how do we learn? Let's go back. Let's go back. Yay. To 1910, there is a chapter in this book that I want you to, or yeah. actually a paragraph. Can you yeah. read that for Yes. Me? So I, he had me read this before we got started, and I was like, we have to read this. It's amazing. So it says, and when was this from? 1910. In the past, in the cities, as in the smaller towns at present, the supply was largely furnished by the producer directly to the consumer. 
This direct contact afforded the consumer the opportunity, if he desired, of informing himself of the conditions under which his milk supply was produced. The advent of the middleman in the business and the gathering of the milk from many hundreds of farms and its redistribution to thousands of consumers has made it impossible for the individual consumer to learn anything of the conditions surrounding pr uh, production. When the individual cannot protect himself against fraud and unhealthful conditions, it is the business of the government to protect him. This is the theory for the modern control of food supplies, water supplies, and of living conditions in general. Um, and then acting on this basis, the cities are seeking to control, uh, to an increasing degree, the healthfulness and cleanliness of the milk supply. Okay. So what we've 1910. seen... Okay. Prior to pasteurization, we had direct marketing. We had face-to-face -face interaction because we didn't have a transportation system. Mm -hmm. We didn't have refrigeration. We yeah. didn't have a trucking industry. We didn't have any of this. Right. So we followed this whole process and we are, and this is an industrial model. Yeah. And it's been consolidated. Mm -hmm. So we have very few players and they are actually bigger than the government. Mm -hmm. And they have corporately captured these government agencies and they are making known what the laws of the land are. This is where the prohibition of retail sale of raw milk originates. Right, right. Because it's competing with the industrial model. Isn't it interesting how it all comes full circle? But what we just read says, when a consumer is buying directly from the producer, yep. then you can know everything that we do. Yeah. And you have direct access to ask questions to the producer. Yeah. And you could be taught everything that you're desiring to know about the product. Well, and you guys just had your Maple Days yep. event. And so you guys are always having people come out to the farm. You're showing people around. They get to see the cows. They get to see how all of your various products are made. And you don't get any of that. And and I get, I get to be, I don't have to have a government agency tell me this is safe. <laughs> we looked into this. This is good to go. I can make that decision myself. So we have the freedom of choice. Yeah. Which is really what this all boils down to. If we don't lose it. Right, right. Well, and then, so so now let's pivot a little bit and let's talk about nutrition. All right, so we, we, we recognize that there's a bit of an issue with the way things are largely being done. So let's talk about that model and, and where it's headed because obviously not everybody's buying direct from okay. their producer. So the, the conventional model, where's that headed? I spent a lot of nights thinking <laughs> i'm sure a lot yeah uh the conventional model works for the farms that have thirty thousand cows yeah actually the pay price helps anybody that's milking over two thousand cows mm -hmm. for the small family farms that doesn't work right the organic model was their hope mm -hmm. uh they're losing the market yeah i mean they just don't have a market that yeah. will pay them enough so we went to grass milk that actually, the pay price eroded, oh. and the fees, the deductions from the milk check made that not viable. Okay. So we went directly to raw milk. Um, the business model for conventional food is mature. It's consolidated. Mm. COVID exposed its failure. Yeah, big okay. time. The meat counters were empty. Yeah. Farmers were euthanizing hogs because they couldn't get them butchered. Ugh. Dairy farmers were dumping milk because there weren't enough processing plants yeah. and they couldn't change the containers and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, the system has been streamlined and consolidated to the point where it's maxed out. Yeah, I think so too. It's kind of like the electric grid when you start getting brownouts and it's overloaded. Mm -hmm. um, so what is going to, what's going to appear? What's it going to look like in the future? So for me personally, as a small local farmer, uh, I can't pack up my farm and go to another country. Mm -hmm. I can't go to another state. Uh, I'm here. Well, and honestly, this is where we're meant to be. We've got work to do here. Okay. My family's here. So there is a viable way forward. 
Okay, tell, tell there, us about it. There is a saying, necessity is the mother of invention. That's true. So we're going to have to think outside the box. Yeah. I have a raw milk permit. I have a few local customers. The regulations say on-farm sales only, mm. but we have technology. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the technology has created problems, but we have an on online store. Yeah. Which is an on-farm sale. Oh, interesting. Right? I didn't know that. We have the store. It's all, the computer is hooked up. Mm -hmm. You can order online. You can pay online. And all you have to do is pick it up at mm -hmm. the farm. Interesting. And so that's what we've done. Yeah. It's called Community Supported Agriculture. CSA, yep. Uh, the vegetable growers love it. Yeah. Uh, I know a vegetable grower in New York who put on a dairy farm just because he already had the customers and they wanted the dairy products. Interesting. Yep. So it's a viable model. Mm -hmm. It's legal. You, uh, you get your permit to sell raw milk. If you already have a veg, I know a, a farm that called me and they already have the vegetable customers and they're going to start doing that. So there, so there is a way forward. There is a way forward. Uh, the, that's the easy way. Uh, you can buy a cow. <laughs> well, and, and I do, I talk a lot about that. I do think that we, we should take some of the control back into our own hands for our own families, but we can't do everything. So community is right. important. So let's start with what we can do. Yeah, I agree. If, if you're in uh, an area where you have ground, you can plant a garden. Mm -hmm. You can plant fruit trees. Yep. You, can, you can grow what you can grow. Yeah. Put a little flock of chickens out there. Feed them your scraps. You got your eggs. Yep. Uh, you got chicken soup. Yep. And then also get connected with your farmers for what you can't produce yourself. Yep. Get connected with your farmers. Yep. This was great. Now is the time before the crisis hits. I agree. To build those connections and discover what you can do to help. Yep. Thanks so much for hanging out and listening to this. You guys will see you in the next episode of the Sustainable Farm Podcast.